DevOps has been the buzzword for almost two decades now and its adoption is growing rapidly. IDC forecasts the worldwide DevOps software market to reach $6.6 billion in 2022, up from $2.9 billion in 2017. But what exactly is DevOps? What kind of tangible benefits can DevOps bring? Hey guys, this is Eric from Invensys Learning and I welcome you to our YouTube channel. In this DevOps tutorial session, we are going to learn everything about DevOps from a beginner's perspective. Here's the agenda. We will begin the session with a brief discussion about the history of software development. Then we will then take a look at the methodologies that were used before DevOps came into existence. Post that we begin with our main topic, which is DevOps. Here, we will discuss various DevOps tools and their usage in the life cycle. Next up, we will perform some interesting demos that will help you understand how DevOps is actually being used in real-world scenarios. Then we will also go through some real-time DevOps case studies. Finally, we will conclude this session by discussing career opportunities in DevOps and the different top DevOps certifications that you should have today. Sounds interesting, right? So let's get started. I am sure you guys might have heard the term software development. We will start off by understanding what is software development, the importance, and the phases of the life cycle. Software development is nothing but the conversion of customer ideas into complete operational software. This process is known as software development. Software development is vast and it requires a systematic plan to release the software. And this systematic process is known as SDLC software development life cycle. So what exactly is SDLC? SDLC basically stands for software development life cycle. It is the detailed blueprint that defines how software is developed, tested, and maintained the application. SDLC outlines the methodology for the betterment of application development. It is also known as the application development life cycle. And it is a long process. Software development life cycle breaks down the process of software development and helps us to evaluate the software development process. Software development has several phases, so let us see the phases that are involved in SDLC. The phases that are present in SDLC are requirement, design, implementation, verification, and maintenance. The requirement phase is also known as the planning phase, which allows the development team to get the requirements from the client. Once the requirements are documented then the process will be moved further to the design phase. The design phase will start with the planning of requirements and their feasibility, where the architect will create the required prototype and send it to the client. This phase will include the user interface design with its core functionalities after the client's approval designs will be forwarded to the development team. Here the implementation phase begins, by the name implementation, it is responsible for converting the designs to application code. The application code is created by the development team with all the functionalities. Post that, the code will be sent to the operations team for testing. Because, we cannot move the application directly to the internet without validating the code, so here the verification phase begins. Verification is an important phase inside the software development, so the code is verified using test cases, and there are multiple techniques involved in verification and store the reports for further use. If the verification is passed then the code files will be moved to the live server, if not, the code will be sent back to the implementation phase. Here let us assume the application code is passed with all test cases, then the application will be deployed over the internet. There the maintenance phase starts, which is completely responsible for the maintenance of the servers and application and its dependencies. The feedback of the resources is gathered and shared with the development team for rectification. The process will repeat for the entire development. There are various software development life cycle models defined and designed during the software development, so let us see various life cycles present in the IT industry. So let us understand the life cycle models present in the IT industry. We have four different life cycles that are followed in the market so that we will discuss one by one. Waterfall model. Agile methodology. Lean model. DevOps. In the early stage of application development, this is a well-documented process where the requirements are given and asks the developers to create software. To facilitate this process we have followed a model called waterfall, which is the oldest model in the development of software. Post that we have faced some problems with the waterfall model due to changes in the requirements on regular basis, so for having these changes our market adopt a methodology known as Agile, where the development works based on the priority of the tasks and helps us to make shorter releases and fast delivery. Now, the work is being segregated into smaller parts based on priority after Agile, but, the quality of it depends on the individual who is responsible for the task. So to increase the quality of products companies adopt a model known as the Lean Model, 
which helps the individual to improve the quality. So these are the models that are used in the market prior to DevOps but DevOps is used to achieve team coordination. This is an overview of the life cycles, let us explore them further, starting with the waterfall model, which is the oldest model used for software development. What is the waterfall model? The waterfall model is a breakdown of project activities into linear sequential phases, where each phase depends on the deliverables of the previous one and corresponds to a specialization of tasks. As this model is originated in the manufacturing and construction industry, where the highly structured environment helps us to follow the sequential order, if the issue persists with the deliverables of the previous phase then it can move further and it is a documented process so requirements given at the time of development cannot be facilitated. Pros It is a well-documented process with well-determined milestones. Cons Waterfall has a lot of drawbacks as it cannot have the application until the final stage is finished and this is not suitable for object-oriented projects. So far, we try to understand about waterfall model now we will see about the phases involved in it. There are six major steps involved in this model. Feasibility check. Analysis. Design. Coding. Testing. Maintenance. Now, if we compare this with our software development life cycle, Feasibility check and analysis comes under the requirements phase. All details related to the project were taken into consideration and checked for its feasibility. After confirming that the application can be built with the requirements, it will be further analyzed to finalize the complete requirement. Complete requirement analysis is given to the design team to create designs for it. And it will be analyzed again with the client for approval and once approved the application will be sent for development. Thereafter the process remains the same as the software development life cycle i.e., coding, testing, maintenance. This is about our waterfall model and its phases. To overcome the drawbacks of the waterfall model we have agile methodology so let us start with the agile model. This is used to overcome the problems of the waterfall model but we will see its features and posts that we will understand how to overcome the problems of the waterfall model in detail. Agile is a software development methodology, that involves discovering the requirements and developing solutions with collaborative effort. Its main features are adaptive planning, development, and early delivery. The Agile model believes that every project needs to be handled differently and the existing methods need to be tailored to best suit the project requirements. So the project will be planned according to the delivery and its features on priority. The phases involved in this model are the same as the software development lifecycle, except with the priority which is used to plan the project by prioritizing the work into smaller parts. Pros it is the realistic approach to the project that works based on the priority of requirement and allows faster releases. Cons. By working with the priority to finish and release the application sometimes the quality will be compromised and if there's any conflict between the collaborated teams cannot be resolved easily. This is about our agile model, but to maintain the quality we have a model that works on principles so let us see the phases involved in the agile model. In this slide, we will start with the phases of the waterfall model. Feasibility check, in this phase, the team will get the requirements of the client and check its feasibility. Analysis, once the requirements are given, those are analyzed and sent for the design. The analysis will be shared with the client, and once it is approved and on, the final requirements will be sent to design. Design, in this phase, the requirements are converted into designs or prototypes. Coding, the approved design will be sent to the development team to convert design into application code. Testing, the application code will be verified with the functionalities with the help of test cases. Maintenance, after testing, the application will be sent to the production server and the operation team will maintain the application. As discussed earlier, the problem with the waterfall model is with the dynamic requirements in the project. To overcome this, we have an agile model, so we will try to understand the agile model. Agile model is used to overcome the problems of requirements and works based on the priority. Agile is used for the shorter releases if you want to deliver the project based on the priority and faster releases. We will now understand the Agile model phases. Here Agile model has five phases and those are Priority Design Coding Testing Release Here the coding, testing, and release phases are the same as the waterfall model. Agile does not follow the sequential order, and it works on a priority basis. In Agile, priority is the phase that is added additionally to choose the requirements. So this will helps the team to deliver the project faster, by planning the features accordingly, but there is a problem, with the quality of the project. So we will see how we can overcome this problem with Lean model. Lean is the model, 
that concentrates mainly on the principles, to improve quality, and with the help of principles, the work can be improved. But the major drawback of the lean model is, if one of the employees does not follow these principles, then the quality of the product might be compromised. So now, we have issues with the team coordination in this model. It can be achieved, only if every employee follows the principles. Now, we will understand the difference between the SDLC models. Here, we will understand the difference between the waterfall model, agile model, and lean methodology based on process, scope, feedback, drawbacks. All these models involve improving each other, starting from the waterfall model, agile model, and lean methodology. First, the waterfall model cannot facilitate the shorter releases, to facilitate that we have the agile model. Now, agile helps in faster releases, but for improving the quality, we have a model called lean that follows seven principles. But there is a drawback in coordinating with the team. These are the major life cycles used prior to DevOps. Now, we will start with the origin of DevOps. Now, we will understand the origin of DevOps, which helps us to overcome the problem, with the lean and agile model. So let us start with, DevOps origin and its trivia. Here we will understand the origin of DevOps. As we discussed earlier, this is originated to maintain team coordination. So DevOps is the key to maintain the team coordination between the developer and the operation team with the automation. So now we will understand the trivia of the word DevOps. The concept of DevOps emerged out of a discussion between Andrew Clay and Patrick Dubois in 2008. They were concerned about the drawbacks of Agile and wanted to produce something special. The idea slowly began to spread, and after the DevOps Days event held in Belgium in 2009, it became quite a buzzword. DevOps is a combination of two words, developer and operations. As the buzzword started its expansion in the market, we will begin with the definition of DevOps. Now we will start understanding what is DevOps? DevOps is originated, with the drawbacks of the waterfall, agile, lean model. Now, we will see the exact definition of it. DevOps is a methodology used in software development, to resolve the conflicts between, the developer and the operations team. This process is automated with the help of automation tools. To make the changes continuous, and which makes the maintenance easier. We have learned about, what is DevOps? Now we are going to see, the life cycle of DevOps. So let us start with it. DevOps life cycle has many phases, so we will discuss with a sample workflow that will help us to understand DevOps. The development team is being assigned the features to an application. Now, the code files will be created and sent to the version control system to handle the code files shared by all other developers in the team. Once the version of the code file is managed, then we need to build the application. Building of the application will be done under testing server with the help of continuous integration, which helps us to integrate the application with the latest version of the code file. So testing will be done in test servers, with the help of various testing techniques, and once the tests are passed, the application will be deployed to the production server from which the application will be pushed over the internet. Suppose the test cases failed, or there are any issues with the application in production servers. In that case, they will be monitored by the continuous feedback system and shares the feedback with the developers to resolve the issues. This is all about the life cycle that is followed in DevOps, but the main feature of this process is automation, where the complete process is automated. Now we have seen how the DevOps life cycle works in an overview, and now we will understand the different phases of the life cycle in detail. Phases of DevOps life cycle. In the DevOps life cycle, there are five significant phases those are. Continuous development, where the code file is created and developed by the developers. In this phase, the application code is created and maintain its versions. Continuous testing, the application code will be sent to the testing team for testing it. Once the test case is passed, it will push the code to the deployment, or else if the test case failed it share feedback with continuous monitoring. Continuous deployment, here the tested application will be live over the internet. Continuous monitoring, if there is any feedback with the code functionality and the live server is collected and shared with the development team to make the changes to the code. Continuous integration, the process of automating these phases and build the application continuously is known as continuous integration. Now we will see furthermore on the aspects that are included in the DevOps lifecycle. Continuous development has planning and coding phases, which are responsible for the development. Then the code will be sent to continuous integration, from where the application code will be sent to continuous testing. Continuous testing includes build and test phases, these are responsible for testing the code and share the feedback to continuous integration. Once the test cases are passed, 
then the code will be moved to continuous deployment, or else the feedback will be shared with the development team to rectify the code, and then the process will be repeated. The continuous deployment consists of deployment and release. Once the application code is approved by the operations team, then it will be forwarded to this phase, where the application will be deployed and released over the internet. Once deployed, then the application will be monitored in continuous monitoring, and the feedback will be sent back to integration to inform developers of the updation. Here continuous integration is the heart of DevOps which will coordinate with all other phases of the DevOps life cycle. All this automation will be done with the help of DevOps tools. Now, we will understand much more about the tools that we are going to use in this life cycle. So let us start. The tools that we are going to cover in this tutorial are Version Control System Container Orchestration Tool Continuous Testing Tool Continuous Integration Tool Demo on Jenkins Continuous Monitoring Tool Configuration Management Tool Terraform So let us start with the Version Control System. Version control is required of a group of people working on the same file so that we can retrieve the data if the latest version got compromised. Now we will see why and how version control works. Let us assume there are three developers working on the features of the application in the same code file. It is hard to track the changes parallel, and there are a lot of issues while coding and integrating within the same code file. In order to maintain the track of code files and make the changes with the latest updated code, we use version control in DevOps. Here in version control, we have tools like Git, Bitbucket. But Git is used widely for source code management and integration with other tools. We will see the components of Git that help in understanding the process. There are four significant components of Git those are Working Directory Staging Area Local Repository Remote Repository So now we will discuss these components one by one. Working Directory is that location in your system where your code will be stored. In the working directory, we have the files, but we do not have a track of the changes. So in order to track the changes, we have the staging area. It is a logical location where the file changes will be noted and tracked by Git. Once the code is finished, it will be committed in the local system, but the code file changes are saved in the local system now in order to get the changes updated and shared with the team. For sharing the code with the team, we have a common location called GitHub, which is a web interface of the Git tool where the repository in GitHub is known as a remote repository. Now we will see the standard git commands that are used in day-to-day -day activities. Common git commands. Git add, this command will help git to track the changes, and add them to the staging area. Git commit, this command allows us to commit the files, present in the local repository. Git push, this command will enable us, to push the commit to your remote repository on the GitHub. Git remote, this command is used to, add the remote repository in your local PC git in it, this will initialize, Git inside the local repository git branch, this is used to create branches. These are the few commands, that we use in git, and after version control, we have to build the application and send it to testing, so we will discuss containerization tools for building. Container orchestration tools. In this, we will understand container orchestration and why it is required in DevOps, and the tools used for it. Containerization is nothing but, the process of virtualizing the required software. The virtualization will occur at OS level. This will help us, to use the environments with minimal size. For this containerization, there are two primary tools, one is Docker and another one is Kubernetes. These are the tools used to create the required environment for code execution. This is the basic definition of container orchestration now, and we will see a scenario of why this orchestration is required. Containerization is used, to maintain the code dependencies and environment changes between the developer and operation team. Now let us take a look at the scenario below. The developer works on a feature and finishes coding, and sends the code files to the operation team, where the tester has no idea about the environment that the application is created, and the testing guy, tests the application with his local system, with the difference in the environment. The code will not work, due to these environmental differences, and the testing guy, will inform the developer that the code is not working, and send the code back to the developer. Now the developer will recheck the code, and the code works fine, so he sends the same files again, but the testing guy sends the code back to the developer by saying it is faulty code. There is a conflict, so to resolve this, DevOps engineers will set up the environment by installing the required software at the OS level. Now, along with the code files, we will send the required environment, to execute the application code. So that the testing guy will run the application, and then the code will work fine. 
To pack the environment we will use Docker. Since we have seen the definition of containerization now, we will see the tools that are used for containerization. Docker is an open source tool used for containerization. It is a computer program that will perform OS level virtualization. Furthermore, Docker has a lot of features, Docker Compose, Docker File, Docker Compose, Docker networks that will help us in the smooth running of applications and we can use multiple containers, and that allows us to run multiple applications under a single server. Now we will see some common commands used for Docker in its day-to-day -day activities. Docker is a tool, and Docker Hub is the web interface of the Docker tool. Docker pull, this command will help you to pull the image from the Docker Hub. Docker run, this command will help you to run the image into the container. Docker ps is used to list the container in. Docker exec command is used to enter the Docker container. Docker commit this will commit the container to image. Docker push, this is used to push the image to the Docker hub. These are the common commands used in Docker tools. So now we will see about Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration tool developed by Google developers, which has more features than Docker. It is used for the health check of applications and helps create the API to our application with microservices. This will follow the master-slave architecture, and the Kubernetes cluster is used to maintain the high availability of the containers. Now we will see the components of Kubernetes. Here, there are several components present in the Kubernetes master-slave architecture. And Docker is the prerequisite to the Kubernetes as it will take the images from the Docker hub. Now we will see the components of Kubernetes in detail. ETCD, this is a key value store used to store all secrets of the cluster. API Server, this is the front-end for deploying all operations in Kubernetes. Scheduler, handles the dynamic resource management for the cluster by scheduling the tasks. Controller Manager, this will combine all processes of the controller. Node, Replication Controller. Kubelet, it takes information from the API Server and ensures application running with these specifications. QProxy, this will act as a proxy to connect with an external host. This is the overview of container orchestration tools now, and we will see the subsequent phases of the life cycle. Continuous testing is an important phase, that will test the application code. This is handled by the operations team, so let us see more about the testing tool. Here testing can be done with different techniques, including unit testing and manual testing, but in DevOps, automation plays an important role, so here we have Selenium for automated tests. Selenium is a portable framework for testing, and it does not require any new scripting language for testing. Selenium is a framework that will be helpful to test web applications and run functional tests. Let us see the components of testing. Here we have four major components in Selenium. Those are Selenium RC, Selenium IDE, Selenium Grid Web Driver. Selenium RC is a web server and that acts as HTTP proxy. This system is also known as Selenium 1. Selenium IDE is created as a Firefox extension, which will increase the speed of creating test cases. Selenium Grid will enable the parallel testing of multiple applications, which will minimize the time taken for its execution. WebDriver is the first testing framework that can control the browser from the OS level. These are the components of Selenium. Now we will see different types of testing present in the software testing. In software testing, there are two different types of testing those are, white box testing, it is a test technique that ignores the system's internal mechanism and focuses on the output. Black box testing. Black box testing is a technique of research that takes into account a system's internal mechanism. It is also called testing of structures. And these are further divided into many testings, so let us see one by one. Black box testing, it is divided into multiple types those are. Acceptance testing, this guarantees that the specified functionality required in the device specifications works. It is to ensure that the product delivered meets the specifications and performs as planned by the client. Beta testing, this is achieved by end users, an outside development team, or by publicly launching the full pre-version of the beta version of the software. The object of beta testing is to deal with unexpected errors. System testing, it ensures that it still functions by placing the program in multiple environments, for example, operating systems. White box testing, is further divided into integration and unit testing. Integration testing, test type in which to generate the output, a group of components are combined. Often, if software and hardware components have some relationship, the interaction between software and hardware is checked. Unit testing, it is an individual unit or group of similar units evaluated. The developer often verifies that the unit he or she has introduced produces the expected output against the input given. 
Now we will move on to the integration tool. Continuous integration is used to integrate the complete DevOps life cycle. So now, we will talk about integration in detail. Continuous integration is the heart of the DevOps life cycle, and this is used to integrate the code with the help of automation, and you will get the feedback quickly. It is also responsible for the deployment and maintenance. Jenkins is the best tool, used for continuous integration and deployment. Now we will see how integration will happen. The process will start by getting the code files from the source code management, and the code will be built with the help of a Docker container, and the application will be sent to the testing team, and the test application with automated test cases. Once test cases are passed, then Jenkins will convert the build to deployable WAR files, to release the application. These steps are the primary process, that is followed in continuous integration. Now we will see the Jenkins architecture. Jenkins will follow the master-slave architect, and to connect with the master and slave, Jenkins will use the JNLP connection, which will connect with the help of Java and SSH. By default, Jenkins will be displayed over port 8080. Now, we will see a demo on Jenkins, how to integrate DevOps tools with Jenkins. Now we have successfully integrated the DevOps tools, now we will see about monitoring tools, which will help us monitor the production environment for application maintenance. Continuous monitoring is a process, used to check and notify the potential risk and the functionality of the software. It is handled by the operations team, to maintain the software. Nagios and Splunk are the essential tools, that help us to monitor the application. Now in DevOps, we use Nagios for monitoring, so now let us see about Nagios. The key features of the Nagios monitoring tool are Detects network and server problems Maintain security and availability of systems Monitor and troubleshoot server performance Respond to the issue at the first sign of a problem Monitors entire infrastructure Now we will see the process of Nagios Nagios is a tool used for continuous monitoring of systems, applications, and services in DevOps. Failure will alert the technical people, which allows them to rectify it before it affects the business processes. So, let's see the working of this tool with the help of the diagram. Nagios usually runs as a service and has plugins that reside on the same server. They contact servers on your network, which either be remote or on the internet. You can view the status information using the web interface of Nagios, and receive an SMS notification to your mobile phone. Now, this service behaves like a scheduler, as shown in the diagram, which runs the scripts and stores the same results and will run other scripts if these results change. Plugins are nothing but scripts that can be executed by a command line to check the service's status. Thus, it determines the current status of your services on your network. Now we will move ahead with the configuration management. Configuration management is used to manage the configurations in the clusters of software development. So let us see about the tools used for configuration. Configuration management is a process to maintain the consistency of configurations in node machines, and there are different types of tools used for managing the configurations. Those are Ansible, Puppet, and Chef. There are two types of configuration management tools that are push and pull configuration. Push configuration is used to push the configurations from the master machine to the node machines. Pull configuration helps nodes to pull the changes from the master. So let us start with the configuration management tools. Ansible. This is a push configuration tool that uses SSH and Python for connecting to the cluster. Puppet. This is a pull configuration tool and uses SSL certificates for connecting to the cluster. Chef. This is used to convert infrastructure to reusable application code. Chef uses recipes and cookbooks. Okay, let us discuss the architecture of configuration management tools. In Ansible, the configuration management will be done using a playbook with YAML syntax. The playbook will be written in the master machine, and push those to the node machines in cluster and. The cluster will be connected with the help of SSH and Python. Once there is any chance for the cluster to update, then the DevOps engineer will use a playbook, and that will help to maintain the consistency of configurations in the cluster. Now we will see about Puppet architecture. Puppet is a pull configuration tool, that will help the nodes to pull the changes, and now we will see the connection between master and node. The relationship between the master and slave is connected through SSL certificate. First, the node will request a master certificate to check the configurations. Then the master will send the certificate and validate the node. Now, the node will update the details given by the master certificate and once changes are made. The node will send its updated certificate to the master. Thus the connection will be established, and the configurations will be installed. Chef is a reasonably common IAC method. It uses DSL based on Ruby, 
and this is definitely a big plus. From the outset, it has cookbook versions and helps you to maintain a consistent setup. Even when the infrastructure has to keep up with the rapid development of the app that it hosts, this is possible. At the center of its nature, the chef offers recipes and cookbooks. There are self-styled template appellations and template sets you can use out of the box. A single task should usually be connected to one cookbook, but it can offer a variety of different server configurations depending on the resources involved. Chef also fits very well with other IAC platforms, including Terraform, as well as many other cloud environments, since it supports cloud provisioning APIs. Similarly, we have infrastructure as a code tool called Terraform, so let us discuss it. Terraform is a tool that can integrate with cloud platforms to create the infrastructure in the form of code. The current market is revolving around cloud computing, so the infrastructure will be provided under the cloud provider so as to create infrastructure in the form of reusable code. Here Terraform is used to develop infrastructure on the cloud. This will be integrated with all types of cloud providers. So this is used widely in the organizations where they are using the cloud for their infrastructure. These are the widely used DevOps tools that will help in the lifecycle development. Now let us see some real-time case studies used in DevOps. DevOps is widely used in the market by various companies, and now we will understand the case studies of NASA and HP companies to resolve the problems. For greater agility and cost savings, NASA had to shift almost 65 applications from a conventional hardware-based data center to a cloud-based environment. Managing multiple virtual private clouds, VPCs, AWS accounts were burdensome. Now the solution to this problem is resolved by using the Ansible Tower that helps NASA to export its 65 applications successfully. Key benefits of using Ansible. The time required to update NASA.gov has been reduced from 1 hour to 5 minutes. Stacking applications from 1 to 2 hours to less than 10 minutes per stack. Real-time disk and RAM monitoring was achieved. Now, we will see the case study of HP. In 2006, developers of HP spent around 5% of their time building different products such as printers, scanners, etc., and the rest on planning, integration, and testing. Around 400 plus developers, but just two app launches a year, spread through countries such as the USA, Brazil, and India. This is because LaserJet models had different code bases that created significant efficiencies. After six weeks of writing code, software bugs were found through manual testing. For developers, fixing a bug that occurred weeks earlier in a code was labor-intensive and tiresome. To overcome that, HP incorporated the continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline, which solved their problem. Their first move was to create a common form for all goods and models to be sponsored. This was referred to as trunk-based development or continuous integration that removed the toil caused by numerous code branches being merged. As a result, reduced the manual test time of six weeks, improving product quality and timely reviews. HP uses a stop line tool that alerts the developer when code breaks any builds or unit tests. These are the few case studies in the market. Now, we will see the career opportunities in DevOps. For DevOps, there are a lot of career opportunities. Now we will understand the salary trends and job openings around the world. Now we will see the average salary trends of the top 5 countries in the world offering DevOps roles. USA average salary, $115,000, Canada average salary, $84,000, United Kingdom average salary, Euro 46k, India average salary, 6.5 lakhs INR, Australia average salary, $130,000. Now we will see the average job openings in the top 5 countries in the world offering DevOps roles. Canada job openings in 2021, 3,500. USA job openings in 2021, 46,000. United Kingdom job openings in 2021, 9,000. India job openings in 2021, 15,000. Australia job openings in 2021, 3,000. Yes, DevOps is a good career opportunity. Now we have seen the stats of job openings and their salaries around the world, and we will see the skills required for the DevOps roles. For DevOps roles, there are some common skills that are required for jobs, so let us see the standard abilities. Linux fundamentals and scripting. Knowledge on various DevOps tools and technologies. Continuous integration and continuous delivery. Infrastructure as code. Key concepts of DevOps. Soft skills. Programming languages. The above are the common skills required for the DevOps roles. If you are interested in the domain, then start learning these skills, which will help you in landing a new job. As DevOps is a manager-level role, 
It requires you to have some experience to kickstart your career as a DevOps engineer, but if you are a beginner, then certifications will help you to surpass the experience. So let us see some certifications that will add value to your resume. The certifications are divided into three types based on the experience based on beginners, mid-level, and professional with experience. DevOps Foundation Certification This certification is for beginners looking for DevOps as a career. DevOps Master Certification This certification is suitable for one to two years of experience in the IT industry. DevOps Professional Certification This certification is for experienced people with hands-on knowledge. Certifications will only be valid if there is a governing body, so I would like to give a brief introduction about the certificate providers. DevOps Institute and Exxon are the major certificate providers to certify the DevOps skills. Both Exxon and DevOps Institute will testify the skills on key concepts of DevOps. For more details of training, reach out to InvensusLearning.com. DevOps Institute offers DevOps Foundation Certification and DevOps Professional Certification. Exxon offers DevOps Master Certification. Now, we will check the exam pattern and the roles that are suitable for the certification. DevOps Foundation Certification Exam Pattern Type of Questions, Multiple Choice Number of Questions, 40, Examination Duration, 60 Minutes, Result, 65% Required to Pass, Eligibility Roles are, DevOps Engineers, Integration Specialists, Operations Managers, System Administrators, Network Administrators, Project Managers, Business Managers, Automation Architects. DevOps Master Certification Exam Pattern, Type of Questions, Multiple Choice, Number of Questions, 50, Examination Duration, 120 Minutes, Result, 65% Required to Pass, Eligibility Roles, Application Developers, Service Developers, Product Owners, Agile Scrum Masters, Project Managers, Test Managers, IT Service Managers, Process Managers. DevOps Professional Certification Exam Pattern, Type of Questions, Multiple Choice, Number of Questions, 40, Examination Duration, 90 Minutes, Result, 65% Required to Pass. Eligibility Roles, Software and Website, Developers, System Engineers, DevOps Engineers, Product and Service Owners, Project Managers, Test Engineers. Here are the references to the certifications, exon.com, devopsinstitute.com. Hi guys, welcome to the demo on the integration of DevOps tools, with Jenkins. In this, we will discuss how DevOps tools are integrated with Jenkins. Jenkins is a continuous integration tool that helps us to incorporate code continuously. Let us begin with the demo. For this demo, we need three virtual machines. Jenkins Master. Jenkins Node 1. Jenkins Node 2. Now, I am using my AWS account to launch these virtual machines. I have launched them with default settings and with the same key pair called Invensys. Now, we will start by logging into the instances. For logging in, we have multiple ways. Today, in this demo, we will use my Git bash to connect with my virtual machines. First, enter the location where my key pair is located. Here my key pair is located under the C drive of my system. Now, copy the file's location and paste it inside git bash along with the cd command. After entering into the location, Run the chmod command that will help us modify the file's permissions and then run the ssh command. Once you execute the command, that will help us to enter into the virtual machine. Let me clear the screen using the clear command. Now, let's start by updating the virtual machine, using the update command, and once the system is updated, we can go ahead with the installation of packages. 
Now the machine got updated, so let us start with the installation of JDK. Use the command apt-get install this will install JDK in your system. It will take a couple of minutes to install JDK. It is asking us whether to continue downloading. Yes, I need to do type Y and click enter. Meanwhile, let us get the package details of Jenkins. Navigate to the browser and type Jenkins installation and click on the link of Jenkins.io, which is the official documentation. Once we enter the link, we can see the installation for different OS as I am using Ubuntu, a Linux machine. So I will select Linux, then Debian for Ubuntu. Now, you can see the installation packages on weekly release and long term so let's select the commands and execute them individually to get the packages. Wuzhe command is used to get the key file of Jenkins. And the second command is used to copy the packages to the default location. After that, we can install the Jenkins by updating the machine. sudo apt-get update and install Jenkins will help us to install Jenkins inside my master machine. Click on Y to continue with the installation. Now, let us start with the installation in node machines. Go to AWS console and navigate to Ec2. And now we will discuss how to connect to the instance using AWS console. Click on connect, and that will help us to connect the virtual machine. And this is my node machine. Let me update the node machine using the update command. I successfully updated my machine and now will install JDK as it is a prerequisite for installation. and click on Y to continue. Let it install and meanwhile launch the second node machine as well using the same connect command available in AWS. Let me drag it to a new window so that we can use it. Now start updating the second machine and install just click in it. Now enter into the master machine and clear the screen. Let me modify the color of the terminal to differentiate the master with node machines by changing git bash terminal settings. Now for master slave architecture in Jenkins, you need to provide keyless access to the nodes. For that, you need to open a directory called SSH and do an ls command for the content. Now, let us start by generating the key inside the machine using the SSH keygen command to use default settings for the key. Click on the enter button until you finish the execution, which will generate a key. And do an ls command again. This time you will see the files added with names id underscore rsa and id underscore rsa.pub. These files have a public and private key that we have generated. Now, let us check the contents of id underscore rsa.pub for the public key. This public key is used for us to connect with node machines. So let's copy it. 
and enter into node machine. In the node machine, enter into the .ssh directory, and inside the directory, we have authorized underscore keys directory, and this is the place where we need to add the public key that will allow us to connect. So open the file with nano editor and paste the key copied from master and save it. For saving the file, use Ctrl plus X and then Y to save the changes. Once it is added successfully, we will check the current directory in the node machine using the pwd command. It shows .ssh directory in Ubuntu user, which means we are in local user, let us add to the root user as well. Use the sudo su command to enter into root user and run cd command to enter default directory of root user and then navigate to .ssh directory. And here, we have authorized underscore keys in root user as well and open it using the nano command. But this time, we don't see the copied key from the master machine, so copy it again and then paste it into this file. Now we have added the key successfully, in OneNote machine, and we will use the same process for the second as well. We will now verify the keyless access from the master, enter it into the master machine and run the ssh command, inside the same .ssh folder where our private key is present. ssh ubuntu at private ip to check the root privilege. And use the exit command to come back to the master. Check for both virtual machines. We can successfully connect to the node machines now without any identity file. It looks good with access, so we will set up the Jenkins dashboard from where we will connect these nodes. Navigate to AWS console, and copy the public IP address, browse it over the internet with port 8080. We can see the URL change to the login page, and here to unlock Jenkins, you need to have an administrator password. If you are new to this domain, don't worry. You can get the initial admin password from the given location, so copy the location and run a cat command in the master machine. Once the command is executed here, we have our initial admin password that is used to unlock Jenkins, so copy it and paste it in the browser and click on continue. Once I click on continue, it navigates me to the plugins page, where we have two options, Install suggested plugins and select plugins to install. So here I am going with the suggested plugins where Jenkins will install all its required plugins. Once I click on the suggested plugins, it started with the installation. Now the installation of plugins is completed and it will navigate automatically to the user page where you can create the user. And in my case, I am creating a user called admin. And once added with all details, click on save and continue. Here you can modify the root URL for Jenkins, but as of now, we are good to go with the public IP, so no changes here and click on save and finish that will redirect you to the final page of Jenkins installation. This page shows Jenkins is ready to use, so let's click on start using Jenkins. This Jenkins installation is finished, but we need to integrate the nodes to the Jenkins master. For node setup, navigate to manage Jenkins in the left hand navigation pane, where you can see an option called manage nodes and clouds. Click on that to handle the node. Here we can see the master added but not the nodes. So click on the new node and give the name as a test server. And it is a permanent agent. Here we need to configure the node details. For the test server, I will be using Jenkins node 1 and followed by the remote directory. In Jenkins, we need to provide the remote directory for the node where all the required jars and logs will be stored. In this dem, 
I am using Ubuntu, so the root directory is Jenkins. After adding the directory, select the launch method here. We are using an SSH connection to connect the nodes. For this launch agent via SSH will be helpful for us to connect with Jenkins master. We have added the details for the node. Now, we will add the details of the node. Host, it is nothing but the private DNS name. So let copy the private DNS from AWS and paste it here. Now, the host is defined but to connect with this machine, and we need to provide the credentials. For us, there are no credentials available, so we will add the credentials. For adding credentials, click on Add, and now we are in the credentials provider by Jenkins. So here, let us configure the credentials. Kind, SSH username with the private key. Then the default details like username i.e., Ubuntu. Here we have this option called the private key, where we need to add the private key that we generated in the master machine. So let me copy the key from the master, and for the private key, the file is id underscore rsa from the ssh directory. This cat command helps us to get the key so let me execute. Yes, here is the private key. I am copying from begging to end and paste it inside Jenkins. Now, I will click on Add, and add the credentials for connecting the node machine. Now under Credentials, we have Ubuntu credentials. After selecting these credentials, we need to use a non-verifying strategy for connecting. Everything looks good, click on Add. Once I click on Add, my node machine is added, and it takes a minute to connect, so let me refresh the screen. See now our node machine is connected successfully. Now let's connect the second node as well. Here my second node, will be for the production server Jenkins node 2. And follow the same steps as node 1, starting with the node description and remote directory and the launch method. Now for connecting, copy the private DNS address and paste it here. Here in AWS, this is my node machine, and copy the private IP DNS name of node 2 and paste it here. We need not add the credentials again. We can select the same one used for the previous node from the dropdown and save it. Let me try to refresh the screen, but the node is still not active. Let's see what happened. Click on the production server and go to log. Where the log says no host file is present. Okay. Here the problem is with the verification strategy as we didn't add the host file in master. So let's modify it by clicking on configure. Here the strategy given is only for the known hosts, so let me modify it to a non-verifying strategy and see whether it works or not. Now click on relaunch agent. Now we can see that my node is connected successfully. So let us go back to nodes. And the node connection is successful. Now let us understand what we have done so far then we will move to the next step. Here, let me show you a representation of our demo. Let us assume this is my master, and these two are slave nodes. Let me name them so that you can visualize. We have connected master and nodes inside Jenkins and create a cluster with these three machines. As we all know, Jenkins is used for continuous integration now, and we will try to integrate a sample website using various DevOps tools. Starting with source code management tool Git and use Docker tool for building the code into an application. Now we will see the flow that we are going to implement in this demo. Starting from Git with the source code to Docker for building the application and expose it over the internet, we will use continuous integration to automate the process when there is a change made to the GitHub repository and it will be executed in the test server and then push it to the production server that is Jenkins node 2, and node 1 is the test server. So let us start our development process on the test server. Let me refresh this connection, now, I am on the testing server, and in this, I will create a local repository called test, where I will write all my code and push it to the git repository. cd command helps me to enter into the test directory. and lets me clear the screen. For websites, we need to code here to reduce the complexity of code. I am using a sample static page with HTML syntaxes. sudo nano index.html will create a file and add some basic HTML content with background color and a heading now, close all the tags and save the file.
Now index.html is created successfully, and the code file is available. Now we need to add it git. But how to do it? You can initiate the git in this local repository using git init, and this command will help us to initiate git. Now git is initiated, and we can add our code files to the staging area using add command so let's execute it. And this dot represents the complete files now. Check the status of this file using git status. It shows no commits yet and at the same time index.html under the changes to be committed section. Now let's do the first commit using the commit command with commit message as the first commit. And it throws us with the permission denied as this is because of the pseudo privileges. Okay. Let me run the same command with sudo in front of it that helps us to make the commit. Now it is committed successfully. Now the changes are added to our local repository, but it is not pushed to its repository. So let me log in into my GitHub account and create a repository. This is my GitHub account. Let's start with a repository. Click on a new repository that will redirect to a new page to define your repository name. The name should be unique, so here I am going to use demo and vents this tutorial to my repository. It is a public repository, and that's it. Click on create a repository that will create a repository in the GitHub account. Now my repository is created, but it has no files, so let us connect this repository to my local repository. So let me copy the link and navigate to the location where the files are committed, and add this link as the remote repository origin. Here use the remote add command for adding a remote repository. Once I click on enter, this will be added as a remote repository. The remote repository is added successfully. So we can push over changes to the remote repository using the git push command. After executing push commands, it asks for username and credentials, so let me give my credentials, and this will push files to the git repository. Now the file is pushed to GitHub so let's check it by refreshing the remote repository. Here after refresh the screen, we can see the index.html available. Now to automate the process, there is a feature called webhook which will trigger an alarm at the given URL. So we will create a webhook. Click on the settings of the repository here, and in the left navigation, here is an option called webhook so click on it. Now add webhook has several parameters, but for this demo, the major requirement is the payload URL. Here payload URL is nothing but the place where we need to trigger the alarm, here, in this case, my payload URL will be Jenkins URL. Let us copy the URL from Jenkins and paste it inside the payload URL. Once added the URL, then add an extension as GitHub webhook. This will trigger the GitHub at Jenkins job. Here we are using this webhook for push events, and this will trigger if a push happened to the repository, then the webhook will trigger and click on add webhook that will create the webhook. Now, we will start with the new job to push the code. To push the code into Jenkins, first test the webhook. So give the name of the job as a test, and it should be the freestyle project, and after clicking it will help us to add the project details. Now, we will start with the job configuration. Here we need to provide the GitHub URL as a source code and the project URL, and we are going to restrict it to the test server as we are in the testing phase. Let's copy the URL and paste it into the job. And same for source code management. Now, the build trigger is the place that will automate the process. Here GitHub hook trigger is used to trigger the job, and here, we are just pulling the code so we will give an echo command under the build. This executes shell will help us run the required commands for our build and click on save to create a job. Here there is no build as of now, so let us push some changes to GitHub and let us see whether the job is triggered or not. Here we will repeat the earlier process of pushing the code from the test server. To add the changes, we will now create the new file called home.html and save the file.
Once the file is added, add it to the staging area and push the changes to the GitHub. Now the changes are added to GitHub, and if we check in Jenkins, then the job starts automatically, and the left-hand navigation pane, we have the job in progress, and this blue ball means the job is completed. Once we click on the console here, the job is successful. We have successfully pulled the code using automation, and now we will build the application. For building, let us install the Docker inside the testing server. Using install docker.io and we can check the version using the Docker version. Docker is installed, so now build the code, and for that, we will use the base image as Ubuntu. Now, Ubuntu is pulled into the system, and this will be the image. So now we will run the image as a container using the run command. And Docker PS will help us to see the image. and the website will be launched with the help of a web server. So, let us install the web server in the container. Now we are in the container and start with the Apache installation. Using install Apache 2, and it will ask for the time zone, so we need to select the time zone, and then it will install in the container and start its service using service Apache 2 start and check the status again to confirm. Now go to AWS console and copy the IP address and browse over the internet and see the output of it. For checking the output, we will now copy the IP and browse with the port. Here we have the default page over the browser. This shows my web server is created successfully. Now, the container is ready, so that we will commit to the container with a new image, and that will help us with the launch of a static website. Once the container is committed into an image, and that will be pushed to the Docker Hub. And the image name should be with the name of the Docker username. First, let us log in into the Docker Hub from the Ubuntu machine, and then push it to the Docker Hub. Now we will run the push command, which will help us push to the Docker Hub. From where we can pull the changes back anywhere from the internet. Here is the image that I pushed from my local machine. Now we will start building with the help of the Docker file. And Docker file is used to automate the container process. So here, I will push the code to the container, using from and copy commands. Now the Docker file is ready to add the changes to the GitHub, but before that, we will create a job to build the application. So, we will start with the second job to build the application. The job remains the same except for the execute shell where the Docker commands are used. Here in the execute shell, we will add the docker build command and docker run command on port 85 and add the complete location of the docker file that will help us to build the application.
So here we have executed the first job and we'll use the same directory for building the application. Add the location in execute shell and save it. We have post build action, which will help us to run the second job. To see the job's progress in a pipeline, we will use the build pipeline plugin in Jenkins. Now, navigate to the manage plugins. And download the pipeline plugin under the available section and click on install without restart. which will help the pipeline view and go to the home page. Now click on the plus icon where it will allow us to create a pipeline view, and here the view will be based on the initial job. So the test job will help us to trigger the restart view as continuous integration. Now, we will push the changes to GitHub to trigger these jobs. So add the changes to the staging area and commit it. We once committed, then push the changes to Git so that the job will trigger. Now we will refresh the screen to see the changes. Now, we can see the jobs in green that means the job is successful. But our build should be continuous on the same port, so we will remove the previous and build again. Let us check the output, but it is not showing because the service is not started yet in the container, so that we will start that. The docker ps command is used to get us the new container ID and enter into the container and start the Apache to help us see the output. Once we start the service, then we can see the website over the internet, and slash home.html will display the home.html page. As we discussed earlier here, to make it continuous, we will remove the previous container, and then the build will be automatic under execute shell using docker rm command. Successfully added the remove command. Now we will test it by running the pipeline view. For now, we will modify the home.html and then push to GitHub for triggering. After pushing, refresh the Jenkins dashboard will help us to see the running of the jobs. Now, the environment is successful. So we will deploy the website to the production server. So to push the changes, we will start with Docker installation. So to get the code, we will create the job.
and then the job will be restricted to the production server, and that will get the code into the instance. Here we'll restrict the production server to execute this job, and in execute shell, we will add the echo command, which will add the code, and so we will build the job. Using the Jenkins dashboard and then the job is successful once the job is successful and enters into the production directory of the instances. Under this directory, the code is copied to the production server, so in the execute shell, we will add the same docker commands for building the application. After creating the job and making the application automated, add this job to the post build action of the previous job under configure. That will help us automate pulling the code, building the application, and pushing the code to the production server. And we will check by executing the pipeline. Then the Docker container that was built earlier will be removed to automate the process continuously. Now, everything looks fine, so run the pipeline to recheck the job status by pushing the changes from the local repository. For that, I have modified the code and pushed it to GitHub so that the jobs are triggered. Thus in this demo, we have seen the continuous integration with the DevOps tools, and here, we can test the website by starting the service inside the container. Thus, the integration of DevOps tools with Jenkins finished by checking the website using public IP over the internet. I hope you got cleared with DevOps basics. For any queries, feel free to write in the comment section. On a concluding note, the DevOps career presents promising opportunities for a flourishing career. 
However, it is also crucial for every candidate to develop the right skills and mindset for a career in DevOps. However, the future is a lot complicated to get a job in DevOps for freshers, and a DevOps certification will stand you out of the crowd. If you aspire to become a certified DevOps professional, start your preparation with the DevOps certifications training courses.